Joining me today, 1045theteam.com, is Kylie McDaniel, lead prospect analyst for Fangraphs.com, one of the absolute best baseball sites out there covering everything from sabermetrics to stats for every player in the history of the sport. Kylie, thanks for being with us today. Yep, thanks for having me. You can follow Kylie on Twitter, at KylieMCD. And Kylie, we've been focusing a lot this week on Garrett Whitley. We talked to Garrett earlier this week. We've talked to John Manuel of Baseball America this week. The, the mock drafts around Garrett Whitley, they've got him going a little bit of everywhere. I've seen him number one overall at Baseball Prospectus. I've seen him 20th at Baseball America. And you had him 12th in your mock draft. So why do you see Garrett Whitley in the upper in the upper half of the first round? Well, he's got a lot of the, uh, you're looking at the sort of broad indicators that you like to look for for high school players. I mean, you want to have ceiling because obviously you would take a college player that's closer to the big leagues. Uh, if the ceiling is comparable or if, you know, the ceiling of a player is maybe just like a lower end everyday player. And so when you're talking about high school hitters, especially outfielders in the first round, you're looking for big, you know, big flashy tools. And Whitley's, you know, as I'm sure you know, big dude, you know, kind of looks like a linebacker. Uh, he's a plus runner. He can play center field. He's got at least average power, which would be 15 to maybe 20 home runs in the big leagues. And if you you know then go look at the leaderboards in the big leagues, guys that can play center field, hit at least 250, hit at least 15 homers, uh, not that long of a list. So when you get that kind of feeling, uh, it kind of throws you into that first couple rounds. And uh, I guess the, the sort of question with Whitley is he's a little bit of a mystery because he showed up on the showcase circuit uh, last summer, kind of late, uh, and he performed well at the couple events he went to, but it's, he's not one of those guys from like Florida where they've seen him against a bunch of guys during 90 during the spring. They've identified him as a sophomore or junior in high school. They've seen him at events for three summers. He doesn't have that kind of track record. And then obviously uh, this spring, he's also not facing you know tons of velocity. I know I heard of one game where he faced a guy uh, that's a junior, uh, Ian Anderson, that throws pretty hard right around 90. But so So scouts have sort of a limited track record, limited amount of confidence about like how much he's going to make contact but every, obviously everything else is there to you know make them want to take him in the first round anyway even though that's still a question i saw that matchup between whitley and anderson and whitley you know was able to turn around 90 mile an hour fastball grounded at hard to third and anderson actually hit him in his second at bat and then uh whitley flew out to center in the third at bat um and anderson's hit as high as 93 uh, in his last start, so so pretty impressive there for competition for Whitley. But again, you're right; it's a small sample size in this area. You've got him going to the Marlins at 12. What about the Marlins makes Whitley a good fit for them? Obviously, in their system, they've got John Carlos Stanton. They've got him for a long time. They've got Christian Yelich. They've got Marcelo Zuna. They've got good young outfield prospects. Why do they want Whitley? Well, when you're talking about the first round of the draft, particularly high school players, you don't really look at the sort of big league need. Uh, because you know, usually when the way these things play out, a lot of times you'll hear it with like the Astros. They're tied to a lot of shortstops with their two top picks this year, and they have you know Carlos Correa is about to get called up, best shortstop prospect in baseball. Typically, if you know, say they take two shortstops at number two and number five in the draft, and then uh, they take two or three years. By then, Correa may have changed positions, may have been injured, maybe he flames out, maybe one or both of these guys flame out. Like it just sort of works itself out, especially when it's big league versus high school. It's going to take three or four years, and by then, you know, extensions run out, things like that. So at that point, they're just looking for the guy they think is the best player, and the Marlins have always been tied to toolsy athletes. They sort of skew toward the, you know, football player with not a ton of baseball reps. Uh, they like northern guys. Uh, they also like guys from sort of the Texas, Oklahoma area. He sort of fits the sort of guy they like, and, uh, and you know, Whitley is sort of a high upside guy they tend to go toward, the sort of high school player. Uh, and there's a number of other teams that are on him as well, but uh, I think what you're seeing when you're mentioning the other mock drafts where they have him, he's a factor at one. I don't think he gets taken there, uh, and I think if he gets past one, it's somewhere in the 10 to 20, maybe 22 range he'll go. And because there's a little bit of unknown with him about whether he makes contact and some teams like high school players, those sort of high picks, and some teams don't, you're going to see some sort of difference. Like uh, from 10 to 22, there might only be four or five teams that will really take him there, but they're kind of spread throughout. So he could go sort of anywhere in that range now that it sounds like they're looking more at college players at number one. I asked John Manuel of Baseball America about this earlier. I want to ask you. Now, you say you think he could be a factor at one of we, as we've seen him on, on other sites projected. And part of that reason I've seen is because they think that they can get Whitley for lower than that number one overall slot allotment, and that will help them sign some players later uh, in the draft. Is that something that happens? Is that something that you think is possible here? 
Yeah, I mean, it's happened before. The way they have the slot set up is no player at number one unless like Bryce Harper is ever worth the full slot. So no matter who you take, like I believe the slot's like 8.4 or something like that, and no one in this draft is worth more than $6 million. So whoever they take there is going to be at least $2 million to change below the slot. And the, 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 the sort of complicating factor, I read an article about it about a week ago, is that the GM, scouting director, uh, VP, president, all these guys for the Diamondbacks got hired after the summer showcase season. They got hired in September, October. So they didn't have only like their lower level like area scouts got to see all these guys over the summer. And so they're going out and seeing these guys during the spring to decide who they want to take, and they don't have the history of last summer to go off of. And I kind of explained why it makes sense on the players they've gravitated to based on that. Like they don't have the question about Whitley about you know, we haven't seen enough of them against the summer. They haven't seen anyone over the summer. So what they're seeing during the spring uh, is the same they're seeing of anyone else. So that would explain why he kind of gets a little higher on their list than he would be on another team's list that has, you know, three years of history with some of these kids from Florida where it's hard for Whitley to overcome that. But when you have no history, it makes sense where he can jump ahead because the tools may be, you know, more attractive to catch him on the right day. Kylie McDaniel, Fangraphs.com, on Twitter, at KylieMCD talking here about Garrett Whitley, about the MLB draft and Garrett's prospects. I wanted to ask you this, something that always just fascinates me. Look, I was a, I was a four-year college baseball player at a Division three school, upstate New York at, at Oswego, played high school ball here, have coached junior college in the area. I know the stigma against Northeast players, but you're starting to see it break down a little bit, aren't you? You've got Whitley. Last year, just out of this area alone, we had Jeff Hoffman. You had uh, Blewett from Baldwinsville out in Syracuse taken in the second round last year. Mike Trout from New Jersey. Matt Harvey's from Connecticut. Are, are Northeastern players starting to get more uh, more deserved recognition now? Yeah, I think part of it is because of that recent track record. Uh, like I know specifically there's a pitcher down in the Philly area, uh, Mike Nickerak, that will probably go in the first round. And I think he's getting a little bit of the benefit of the doubt uh, relative to other uh, Northeastern high school pitchers because last year Blewett went in the second round got like late first round money, and if they read that draft today, he wouldn't have gone in the 50s or 30s or whatever. He would have gone like about 10 because he went a, he did a lot better after he signed. And I think there's a lot of that just sort of recency bias where, oh, I'm looking at a Northeast pitcher. Well, that one last year did really good. I guess I should, and you know, there's a little bit of that, which, you know, obviously will change your year. But like you said, there's also been a nice run of Northeastern guys, whether it's, you know, from, uh, from college, Colin Moran is another guy from upstate New York that went to UNC, like, uh, like Harvey also went to UNC. Uh, and so there's examples of, oh, well, if all these guys are going to college and becoming high six, why don't we try to sign them out of high school? And so now some teams are starting to notice that in sort of the age of, you know, big data where teams can notice things like this by going through uh, all the old drafts and trying to identify these players. And so some of them will see, uh, the lack of reps and the, you know, lack of great competition as an opportunity. Because if they really buckle down on a guy, maybe during the summer, identify him early, they'll be on him during the spring when other teams aren't. And so, yeah, you're seeing a little bit of a shift there. It's being helped some by the recent track record of good players. There was a run at one point in Virginia where players were getting taken higher because David Wright, B.J. Upton, Ryan Zimmerman, Mark Reynolds, like a bunch of really good players all came from there at the same time and kind of played on the same travel teams at the same time. And then that kind of dried up a little bit. So I would imagine that'll probably happen in the Northeast a bit. It'll back off, but I think if, if the long-term track record keeps showing sort of uh, more promise than the places that they're drafted is, then the uh, you know the sort of trend of taking players uh, from up there will continue. Kylie McDaniel, Fangraphs.com, again one of the best baseball sites out there right now. Always depresses me a little bit to go look at my Mariner statistics over the last five years and see the uh, the low WARs. For the Mariners, but again, one of the best sites out there, and, and certainly when it's it's got everything you want when it comes to the draft. We're talking about Garrett Whitley and his prospects. We're going to keep doing it all the way up until the draft. So, Kylie, thanks for being with us, and again, at Kylie MCD on Twitter. Yeah, thanks for having me.